Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I um, want to welcome you to Driven to Extinction, Tire Chemicals and Salmon. My name is Lori Epstein, and I am the Water Quality Director with Columbia Riverkeeper. And I'm just so excited to welcome you all here today. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. We're going to be hearing from Dr. Jennifer McIntyre from Washington State University and Sean Dixon from Puget Soundkeeper Alliance. And they're going to be talking about a highly toxic chemical that comes from automobile tires and how it's impacting our rivers and specifically salmon. I'm joining you from Hood River, Oregon today. And to get things going, I'd love to see where all of you are joining us from. So if you wouldn't mind hopping onto the chat and just type in where you're joining us from, we'd love to see, uh, see that. It's really fun. One of the things I love about these webinars is that people can join us from all over the Columbia Basin and even beyond. So it's just great to see where folks are, um, are logging in from. This webinar is brought to you for free as part of Columbia Riverkeeper's Love Your Columbia webinar series. Columbia Riverkeeper is a nonprofit dedicated to the protect, protection and restoration of the Columbia River. And we use legal advocacy, community organizing um, to stop pollution, fight fossil fuels, save salmon, engage our communities and, and protect the river. And we offer these webinars as a way to connect and help educate the people in our watershed about the issues that are directly affecting the river. Uh, personally, I've been with Riverkeeper for 14 years and a lot of my time here has been working on the impacts of toxic pollution to the Columbia River. Um, I'm a salmon biologist by training, but I'm also a mom and my family swims in the Columbia and we eat fish from the Columbia and I just genuinely care a lot about the health of the river. So while toxic pollution might not be the most glamorous answer when somebody asks me what I've been working on, I really think that thinking about and learning about these issues is incredibly important. If these are issues that also feel important to you, one of the best ways you can support this work is to become a member of Columbia Riverkeeper today. You can do that with a one-time donation or a recurring contribution, um, but we'll put a link in the chat for how you can do that. Um, but we would love if you would join us in our work. Um, before I introduce today's speakers, uh, I'd like to start with a couple of acknowledgements. We at Columbia Riverkeeper recognize the unique and enduring relationship that exists between native people and their traditional territories. We respectfully acknowledge that the places we're joining today's webinar from rest on the traditional lands of native people who have cared for these lands and waters since time immemorial and continue to do so today. I'm joining you from near Columbia Riverkeeper's office in Hood River, Oregon, which rests on the traditional lands of the Wasco Wishram, Warm Springs and Yakima Nation. I would also like to acknowledge um, our sponsors. So this webinar is funded by the United States Environmental Protection Agency's Columbia River Basin Restoration Funding Assistance Program. It's a grants program for environmental protection and restoration programs throughout the Columbia Basin. And the contents of this webinar do not necessarily reflect the views or the policies of the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, I also would like to thank Young Maven. They're a hemp clothing, clothing company that um, offered a 10% discount code to all of the participants. And um, they awful, also, everybody who joined the webinar will be um, entered into a raffle for a chance to win a $100 gift certificate. So thank you, Young Maven, for that. And my final bit of housekeeping is we are leaving time at the end of the webinar um, for questions. So any time during the webinar, you're welcome to type into the Q&A um, and we will answer as many questions as we can um, at the end. There's a slide here showing where the Q&A is. So please just pop them in there and we'll get to as many of them as we can at the end. And I also anticipate that this might be an ongoing conversation. So I'm happy to share contact information, um, you know, and we can keep this conversation going. So with that, I would love to introduce today's speakers. Um, first, we'll be hearing from Dr. Jennifer McIntyre. Uh, she's an assistant professor of aquatic toxicology at Washington State University School of the Environment. Her research specialty is on the toxic impacts of pollutants in urban stormwater runoff to Pacific salmon and other aquatic organisms. Um, Dr. McIntyre was an author on the 2020 paper published in Science that first identified 6-PPDQ, and she also studies the ability of green infrastructure to prevent exposure of aquatic animals to the toxic contamination in polluted runoff. 
And following that, we will have Sean Dixon. He's the executive director of Puget Soundkeeper Alliance, a leading advocate for clean water in the Puget Sound. His background is in environmental law, policy, and science. And along with Puget Soundkeeper volunteers, he's been tracking declining coho populations in the Puget Sound and helped in the research that identified the impacts of 6PPDQ. So with that, I would love to turn it over to today's speakers. Thank you. I'm going to get us started off here. Just click on the correct buttons here. And somebody can give me a nod or heads up that, that things look good. I will proceed. OK, thank you. OK, so yeah, I'm going to um, talk about how we got to where we are, which is having this conversation about um, uh, you know, specifically tires impacting salmon. And, and so this story starts with coho in, in the Pacific Northwest broadly. Um, for those of you that aren't that familiar with salmon, I wanna make sure you understand that, that this species in particular rears for a year and a half in fresh water before they migrate to the ocean where they get really big. And then at three years old, about three years old, the adults will migrate back to fresh water and not just any fresh water, their natal streams where they spawn and then they die after they spawn. And when they do this, they leave behind all those marine derived nutrients um, that enrich the watersheds of the Pacific Northwest where then their offspring are, are going to thrive. So this is what is supposed to happen. <laughs> um, now in watersheds that are impacted by human development, so urbanized or urbanizing, and in particular now we know watersheds impacted by runoff from roadways, Coho salmon are increasingly dying before they spawn, which of course completely defeats the purpose of their lives <laughs> um, almost entirely. So um, pre-spawning mortality, so dying before they spawn, is, is rare in healthy watersheds. Um, it can be caused by a variety of poor water quality conditions, including low levels of dissolved oxygen in the water, elevated temperatures, um, presence of pathogens, and also chemical contamination. In watersheds where we were seeing coho dying around Puget Sound, this is where this phenomenon was first observed, um, none of those reasons could explain the mortalities that we were seeing. Um, we saw evidence that they had been exposed to common pollutants like metals and hydrocarbons, just by virtue of the fact that they were coming through these sort of more urbanized watersheds, but the concentrations of these those chemicals were not enough to explain the mortality. So instead, the weight of evidence was pointing towards an influx of stormwater runoff, so unknown contaminants coming into those streams from stormwater runoff. We found that this, um, these mortalities were both widespread and recurrent throughout the region where, where we, were, we were able to you know, get on the ground and, and make these observations. Um, additional research then with groups all throughout Puget Sound, including municipalities, including tribal nations, including nonprofit groups, including Puget Soundkeeper Alliance, um, were able to, to quantify further where this mortality was happening and the kinds of rates that we're seeing, how, how many of the fish that were coming back were dying. So we have this um, predictive map I'm showing you on the left here for the Puget Sound region. And the highest rates of mortality are the red ones. No surprise, they're going to be in the more built up environments. But along with this, um, researchers were able to do a land use analysis and discover that it wasn't just you know, development more generally that was associated with those higher rates of mortality. It was specifically um, higher rates of mortality with more roads in the watershed or, or the basin and busier roads at that. All right, so this led us towards you know, something not just in stormwater runoff, but more specifically roadway runoff. So we began collecting and testing uh, roadway runoff for toxicity. So whereas mixtures we had made of metals and hydrocarbons that we you know, knew were in the water there, those did not trigger the acute mortality in experiments, but collected roadway runoff was sufficient to trigger this, the mortality in adults, also in juveniles and alevin, which is the recently hatched adorable little life stage. So we reasoned that most of the chemicals in roadway runoff were going to be coming from vehicles. So we started to look at those. Each, each, of, each of these vehicle sources of pollutants is itself a complex mixture of chemicals. 
This figure is showing here um, a non-targeted analysis of water samples. And that just tells us each of these vertical bands is um, a chemical. We don't necessarily have to know what it is, but we're looking for kind of fingerprints, similarities among these different samples. Um, so here we we're looking at a variety of these vehicle sources of pollutants and comparing those then with water samples that we knew killed coho. So a number of runoff samples from a roadway as well as receiving water, so streams and waterways where, where coho have been observed dying. So we compared all these fingerprints and most of those vehicle sources were kind of similar to each other but different from the waterways. The water samples were similar to each other. The vehicle source that separated out from the others and in fact chemically was most similar to those receiving waters that killed coho was water that had come off of tire particles. Right? So this let us know that there were a lot of chemicals from tires that were getting into these waterways and could be the cause of the problem. Now, the fact that there were a lot of tire chemicals, there are a lot of tire chemicals in those waters didn't have to mean that it was a tire chemical or chemicals that were in fact causing the mortality. So to answer that question, we had to actually ask the fish again. So from our studies with whole stormwater runoff, we know that stormwater is acutely lethal to coho, meaning they die within a short period of time, less than 24 hours. We know that stormwater causes certain pathophysiological changes. So things like um, thick blood, um, reduced ions in the, in the blood and also um, reduced pH. Um, and we also know that those impacts were not seen in a closely re related salmon species, which is chum salmon. Um, that returned at a similar time. So if roadway runoff um, is toxic because of something coming out of tires, we would expect a tire leachate to cause these same impacts, right? So through a series of experiments, we compared the response of coho to tire leachate with the response to stormwater runoff and determined that yes, tire leachate is sufficient to cause the acute mortality it's, it makes the coho sick in the same way and it does not impact chum. So this gave us a really good idea that something in tires is in fact the cause of the mortality syndrome. So this then led to a multi-year process whereby we eventually discovered 6-PPD quinone. This study was led by um, Zhen Yu Tian when he was a postdoc, postdoc at the Center for Urban Waters at the University of um, Washington, Tacoma. So what we did is we started with a tire leachate, and this was just water that we passed over fine particles from the tread of tires. Uh, and that water then contained more than 2,000 chemicals. That's what I'm showing you on the far, far left here, more than 2,000 chemicals present in that mixture. What we did then is we started to fractionate that mixture. This basically just means simplifying it chemically through a different, different uh, mechanism. So for example, we started out by putting it through a sand filter. You know, would what comes out still be toxic? Turns out it was, right? And so for each of these approaches, we generated, you know, sometimes several um, different fractions and each time one was still toxic and the others were not. And that toxic fraction now contained fewer and fewer and fewer chemicals. So we used coho mortality to track this toxicity through these different fractions, all the way down eventually to a fraction containing down at the bottom right here, just four chemicals. And this fraction was still lethal to coho salmon. And this mixture was dominated by this chemical that no one had ever seen before, C18, H22, and 2O2. Now we subsequently called that 6-PPD quinone because we learned that um, the parent compound is a chemical called 6-PPD. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute. But once we'd identified this, we were able to synthesize it and or um, isolate it from that uh, tire leachate that we had made. And we're able to show that, that the, um, the toxicity associated with, with complex mixtures like roadway runoff and also tire leachate, you know, that contained itself 2,000 chemicals, um, that this chemical, 6-PPD quinone, was present in those mixtures at a concentration that killed coho salmon. And, and what I'm comparing here is um, the, the dose response curve. So we caught 50% mortality of our fish 
at a concentration of 0.8 micrograms per liter in whole mixtures, that's the concentration of quinone. I'm not explaining this very simply, sorry. Um, and then this bottom panel is showing just that straight chemical by itself, the one chemical. You can see that it's causing the same level of toxicity at about the same concentration. So this let us know that most of the toxicity in those complex mixtures could be explained just by the presence of that one chemical. And that allowed us to conclude that 6-PPD quinone is the primary causal toxicant for this mortality syndrome. So 6-PPD quinone is, is not itself a tiger ingredient, all right? And this is what made the mystery so difficult for, for a while for us. Um, you know, we, we found this chemical, we didn't know where it was coming from, um, but it turns out that 6-PPD quinone is derived from 6-PPD, and this is a tire ingredient. It is, in fact, an anti-degradant, specifically an anti-ozonant, that's added to tires because of ozone. So ozone is um, a secondary pollutant made by UV reacting with nitrogen oxides, of which our combustion engines in our vehicles are a, a primary source, right? So ambient ozone will be you know, a little bit higher near highways. And ambient ozone is continually interacting with the surface of tires. And, and when it interacts with the tire, it can break tire polymers and that's what causes rubber to crack. You know, if you've seen like old bicycle tires and stuff like that, sometimes you see the rubber cracked and that's because of ozone. So in tires, we vehicle tires, ozone is there to protect the tire polymers and instead the ozone attacks 6-PPD. So it's a sacrificial molecule, and there's enough of it added to the tires that throughout the life of the tire, 6-PPD is continuously migrating to the surface of the tire, where it's interacting with ozone and protecting those tire polymers. The byproduct or transformation product of that reaction, though, is 6-PPD quinone. And it turns tires that brown shade, you can maybe see in this photo here, particularly on the sidewall, right? As opposed to the tread, because the tread is continuously being worn down, right? Revealing fresh black rubber. Okay, so here are some of those, those points coming out here. And, and kind of importantly, as a result of this, I wanted to point out that, you know, that this 6-PPD quinone chemical, that transformation product of the reaction with ozone, can leach um, uh, from those tire particles that are worn off of the tire, but also just directly from the surface of a tire, a, ve a vehicle, you know, uh, traveling through rain down a roadway, right? That chemical will be leaching out of the tire itself. Okay, so we've learned that 6-PPD quinone is very toxic to coho salmon. And I want to give you a sense of how toxic it is relative to, relative to other toxic chemicals. So, I went through the chemicals for which EPA has established aquatic life criteria. These are concentration limits in water that are meant to protect aquatic species, right? So these are usually based on the average of the LC50, the median lethal concentration that kills half of your test organisms. It's usually based on an average of those numbers for the four most sensitive species that were tested, all right? So if coho ends up being the most sensitive species for 6-PPD quinone, I wanted to compare them to the most sensitive species that have been tested for these other chemicals. So I went to the data that was used to set those aquatic life criteria, and I pulled out those most sensitive species that had been tested. So I'm showing you here is those, uh, um, those data for chemicals that had an LC50 less than one microgram per liter. So again, what that means is less than one microgram per liter or part per billion would kill half of the animals that you expose to it. And here is our value for 6-PPD quinone, all right? So nearly all of these other chemicals I'm showing you here are organophosphate, organochlorine pesticides, and they have a neurotoxic mode of action. And I'm showing you that 6-PPD quinone is among the most toxic chemicals that we know of for aquatic life. Yay. So the rest of what I want to share with you today is um, things we have learned, some of the highlights of what we've learned in the past two years. So a lot of other researchers have gotten involved to answer all of these many, many questions about this, this new chemical no one knew was there. Um, so I'll briefly go over some of the advancements in toxicology, in chemistry, and some of the solutions people are working on. All right, so in the past two years, additional species have been tested for whether they are also 
you know, have uh, acutely sensitive and die when exposed to this chemical. So three more salmonids um, have been found to be acutely sensitive, brook trout, rainbow trout, also known as steelhead, right? Um, and um, a char species that's native to Japan. And these are all salmonids. Many more species on this list show no lethal response at all, let alone at environmentally relevant concentrations. Um, this also includes some salmonids, right? Remember how chum was not sensitive to stormwater or to tire leachate. So this highlights now that, now that we know coho are not the only sensitive species, um, it highlights that this issue is not restricted to the Pacific Northwest. It, it's certainly relevant in the Columbia River Basin. Um, and we expect to discover more sensitive species over time as people look for them. We're starting to learn about the mode of action of this chemical. So in our research group, Stephanie Blair discovered that uh, coho exposed to runoff experience a severe increase in vascular permeability. So we were interested in why the blood of um, the, our coho when they got sick became so thick. This experiment focused on fish at the stage where they were starting to lose equilibrium, um, which happened several hours before they die. So Stephanie had injected their hearts with Evans blue, which is a high molecular weight dye that will fluoresce under certain wavelengths of light. So she then allowed the heart of the fish to pump that dye throughout the vascular system of the fish, right, all of their blood vessels. And then she rinsed all of the blood out of the blood vessels uh, with a clean saline solution. And in this picture, you can see how the gills of this fish is, is no longer red. It should be bright red, right? Instead, with no blood, we're not seeing the bright red. All right, and then she um, euthanized and, and sectioned the fish and looked for where there was fluorescence in the fish's body. And the only fluorescence would be where plasma from the blood and large molecules, including this, this um, dye, had leaked from the vascular system into the surrounding tissues. And so this figure here sh is showing that. The, the panel C up here, this graph is showing that thickening of the blood, uh, hematocrit, high hematocrit means more dense cells, less plasma. And um, in this case, we're able to conclude that the blood was thick because they were losing plasma into other tissues and also just directly out of their gills into the water. So we're particularly concerned with the leaking that we're seeing in sensitive areas. So the figures on the left here are showing the quantifying the fluorescence, the amount of fluorescence that was seen in a couple of tissues, the brain and then the, also the olfactory rosette part of the peripheral nervous system. And then the, the pictures on the right here are just showing that head region and look and highlighting some of the areas we were concerned about seeing fluorescence, including the brain, right? So um, relative to controls that were not exposed to runoff over here, there's clearly a lot of that dye that had escaped the vascular system and was left behind in these tissues. So vascular systems are leaky to various degrees. So intentionally in tissues like the liver to allow molecules to pass you know, from the capillaries into tissues, but capillaries in the brain should not leak. This is what a blood-brain barrier is for. Um, and so this leaking suggests that the, there's a breakdown in the blood-brain barrier. And we think more broadly throughout the vasculature that this is happening as well. Um, another ongoing area of research is understanding what environmental conditions affect toxicity. Right, so for example, coho are exposed in, to waters both colder and warmer than those we use in the lab. Right, um, other parameters also vary naturally in their um, in their under wild conditions. You know, so we're testing whether we would expect toxicity to be higher or maybe lower under certain environmental conditions. All right, I'm, I'm going to jump to some of the chemistry updates. I'm going to review some global detections. So, for example, um, supporting that 6-PPD quinone is in fact a global pollutant, studies have been published by groups in Canada, Germany, China, Australia so far, uh, measuring 6-PPD quinone in runoff, also in snow and in receiving waters. Um, also showing concentrations in um, air um, and in dusts, things like the dusts in houses or in your vehicle or alongside roads. And the, um, these results, results are in agreement with our expectations that we would find 6-PPD quinone everywhere that there are tires in use, right? 
And the concentrations that are being reported are consistent with the environmental detections that we first reported. So detections in runoff and snow, for example, above the lethal concentrations um, and in receding waters, you know, where the fish are near or sometimes above those detection, uh, sorry, uh, lethal, lethal levels. Um, okay, we're also learning about additional phenylene diamines, which is um, uh, the, the PD and the PPD for 6PPD. So additional types of these chemicals that are present in the environment. So these two studies here sampled particulates in um, air or various dusts from re regions in China. 6PPD, that parent chemical, the anti ozonic parent chemical is shown in green coincidentally in both of these figures. They are different papers. Um, so we're seeing that other anti-degradants are in this class are also present in the environment. And we know very little about their potential impacts or transformation products and their impacts. And finally, there has been one study now published focused on human health. It's published at the end of 2022. Um, and it's showing that 6-PPD and 6-PPD quinone uh, were detected in the urine of humans in urban areas and the highest concentrations, unfortunately, in pregnant women. So this confirms that humans are exposed to this chemical, they're taking up this chemical. And so this makes it imperative that we understand what are the toxic impacts that this may be having in human tissues. All right, and finally, a little bit about the solution side of things. We are learning, um, uh, about the need <laughs> that we have as a society to address the issue of this chemical being present in tires. So we're having ongoing conversations about replacing 6-PPD with a, hopefully a safer chemical, right? Um, something that won't produce 6-PPD quinone, hopefully won't produce any aquatic toxicity. So this is ongoing conversations. A lot of groups are interested in this, including the tire manufacturers, which is very encouraging. Our group and others will be testing um, some of the potential alternative anti ozonants that have been identified by regulatory agencies in Washington State and in California. And we'll be using whole animals to um, study this, whereas others will be looking at like uh, cell lines, in vitro studies. Now, some of these chemicals have already been noted by the tire manufacturers as unsuitable as a replacement based on critical functions that are needed to protect tire rubber and their, you know, therefore safety of, of drivers. Um, in fact, more recently, the USTMA indicated they didn't feel that probably any of these um, listed here would be acceptable substitutes. Um, at the same time, new research shows that some of these alternatives are already in tires um, as mixtures along with 6PPD. So, um, one of the things we're going to do over the next few years here is learn, learn more about these classes of chemicals, what makes them toxic, and maybe which versions of them might not be toxic or how they might be engineered to be um, less toxic or possibly non-toxic. So while we work towards a replacement chemical, we continue to pursue treatment options. Our research group is focused on the ability of various green stormwater infrastructure um, technologies to remove tire derived chemicals and other stormwater pollutants as well. These are technologies that encourage runoff to spread out and soak into soils um, instead of running directly into the nearest water body, right? So things like permeable pavements, bioretention, bioswales, rain gardens. And we study a variety of these at the Washington Stormwater Center, which is co-located at the University of Washington and Washington State University. So in particular, we studied a lot of bioretention, um, and this is the simple technology used in rain gardens. So this treatment approach uses an engineered soil to filter contaminants in runoff. And in, in Washington state, this mixture is, is a, it's a simple mixture of, of sand and compost together. So we previously showed, before we'd identified this toxicant, we showed that bioretention filtration can prevent that acute lethal effect of roadway runoff. Um, these videos are from an experiment where fish were exposed for 24 hours to either clean well water runoff or runoff filtered through bioretention. So at four, we're looking at the fish at four hours and the fish in, in um, runoff were already sick. It's the, the fish in the middle here showing that loss of equilibrium that eventually just a few hours later will lead to death. Um, 
but the same water on the right in the, that had been filtered through bioretention, that same water caused no mortality, no changes in behavior. Um, the, fish, the fish appeared healthy in that, in that water. So we've shown that bioretention filtration can work to prevent this acute lethal impact, not just in adults, but also in juveniles and those recently hatched aelvin. And in um, experimental bioretention systems that we've, that we've worked on, with our colleagues at the University of Washington, we've been able to, to go back and look at our uh, chemistry, not quantify, but at least be able to show a little bit about, we were able to show that the chemical 6 ppd quinone was in the water going into the bioretention system, but not coming out. So that's, that's very encouraging. We've also worked with Federal Highways and Washington State Department of Transportation on compost amended bioswales, which can treat runoff adjacent to highways. So, Unlike bioretention, where runoff is treated by vertical filtration through that media, in the, the cabs here, water is designed primarily to be treated as it horizontally passes over compost and interacts with vegetation. Um, and in these studies, we've done again some retrospective analysis and saw a high rate of removal of 6-PPD quinone. Not as good as for the bioretention, but still, still quite, um, quite encouraging. An ongoing experiment that we have uh, with bioretention includes looking at uh, treatment of 6-PPD quinone in various depths of bioretention and across time. So in this study, we completed 10 simulated water years um, with collected runoff. We haven't finished analyzing the 6-PPD quinone concentrations, but we have shown that even after 10 water years of treatment by a system, the mortality was still prevented. Uh, finally, well, I've got, yeah, I think this is the final experiment I was just going to quickly describe. Um, another green stormwater infrastructure that we've studied is permeable pavement. And we've recently completed this study um, of an installation at the IDEA School in Tacoma, which is in collaboration with the Boeing Foundation. And focusing on tire particles, um, Chelsea Mitchell, one of our PhD students, conducted an experiment over three consecutive days to study how tire particles and their associated uh, chemicals are mobilized through these permeable pavements. In this picture, you can see some dark, dark areas on this permeable concrete surface. And that's dark because of the tire particles that have been applied to the surface. She then uh, did a simulated rainfall, so just clean water on top of that. The particles then went into the permeable pavement. Some of them came out. And she also measured the concentration of the chemicals that would be leaching out of those tire particles into the water. And so we're still analyzing that data, but it does look like a lot of the particles are retained in the permeable pavement and that the concentrations of chemicals that leach out of those particles um, declines really rapidly over time. All right, and then finally, we're interested in how um, the bioretention systems we've been studying how they are dealing with tire particles, right? Um, and their associated chemicals. So we're doing a study that's just getting underway now, focused on how bioretention treats the tire particles and their chemicals. So that is my update. And I'm gonna pass things over now to, uh, to Sean Dixon. All right, thank you very much. Um, that was fantastic. I, I kind of am forgetting what I was supposed to say at the start here because I was so enthralled by all that information. Um, I, I want to first start by by saying thank you uh, to to uh, Dr. McIntyre and, and all the other researchers. I think it's been um, years and years and years that you guys have been looking into this since the 1990s. This this phenomenon has been being studied. That's something that's worth repeating. Uh, that's going to be something that I talk a little bit about here. I'm going to share intentionally the same slides on the horrible toxicity that this prevents. Um, but in reality, this is something that you know one would never um, uh, you, you never expect for things like this to to affect um, the state of our science and our understanding of salmon and fishery biology and fishery management. Um, uh, you know when this research when these research projects are started, and so it really is something that. Um, you know, demands increased investment in our science. It demands that we support uh, places like, uh, you know, local universities and experiments about whether or not permeable pavement uh, really does capture tire wear particles. And these things can, can help in the long run when we find 
the one chemical that is the worst thing on the planet or second worst thing on the planet for fish. And we discover that it's in every tire everywhere on the globe and has been for 60 years. And, and so this really just goes to show how, how valuable it is for us to invest in the science of the environment and the world around us. Chemicals like this can pop up anytime, anywhere, a derivative that nobody's ever seen or heard of uh, it can be discovered in 2020 uh, for the first time ever. Um, this isn't just you know, a world that's burdened by things like PCBs and, um, and bacteria and the, and the kind of pollutants of yesteryear. This is really what, what we're looking at right now in terms of a lot of environmental advocacy is, is these contaminants of emerging concern. That doesn't mean that they're emerging. They've, they're, they've emerged, they've been around for 50 years, but of emerging concern because we're just learning about them. Uh, another, a, a whole bunch of work is being done on microparticles and microplastics and other aspects of things. And, and I really do, do commend the scientists here for for going through and, and talking about all of the, the ways um, that, uh, that, that here, let me um, make this full screen if I can, um, uh, full screen, oh, there we go. Um, and, and, and talking about all the different ways in which the blood leaves the, the blood vessels of a fish and how they lose their equilibrium and how they show signs of being impacted. We just call them zombified. So they, they're running around, they've got blood coming into their brains and out of their pores and out of their gills. Uh, and we see this all the time, sadly, in streams throughout the Pacific Northwest, and we've been we've been watching this. Another point I don't want to move past the presentation uh, that Jen just gave without talking about is this green infrastructure that we closed on there, that Jen closed on. And that's really, really key to this whole thing. Uh, a question that came through in the Q&A hit on this question of how long does 6PPD last? What are some of the sources or what are some of the solutions to this problem? Green infrastructure is a solution. Uh, we, we, we did hear just now that tire manufacturers and folks are looking at replacement chemicals. How do we get this chemical out of tires? Um, that's going to take a while. We don't have an alternative yet. We do not have something at the moment uh, that can replace 6PPD uh, in tires and keep them uh, safe and pristine. And so what we're left with is probably another couple decades of dealing with this pollution in, in tires. And we'll talk about some of the secondary markets in, in a few minutes. Uh, and so this has been a 30 year mystery. And I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, these four items in my in the few minutes I have here. One is this, this 30 year mystery, but we have a ticking clock on these solutions. Six PPD, if you keep it out of the stream, six PPD quinone, if you keep it out of the streams, you will save salmon, you will protect the waterways. Um, but tires are everywhere and stormwater management takes a long time. So this is something that I want to dive deep into. Um, but green infrastructure is key at all. Green infrastructure has myriad benefits. Uh, it can uh, help communities with air quality. It can shade buildings and reduce energy costs. It can provide habitat, open space for recreation and community amenities. And it can filter out a whole ton of things from our local waterways that run off of streets. And for the most part, we've known this for a long time. We've known that we can save salmon, coho, uh, rainbow trout. Um, we, we know that we can save them by putting in green infrastructure, but it's been a really difficult process because it takes money, it takes time, it takes intentionality. Uh, and it, you know, it's, not, it's not every day that you're tearing up a street and putting in a new sidewalk. Those things need to be maintained over time. And it really is something that has always just been one of the many things that cities and towns and highway departments focus on in terms of their infrastructure and their capital work, um, because there's never really been one ginormously bad thing in there that has demanded that we act quickly and act robustly uh, to put more green infrastructure in there until now, until just two and a half years ago when the 6PPD quinone was discovered. So thank you, um, again, I can't say enough to thank all of the researchers that have worked on this, the master's students, the PhD candidates, the postdocs, everybody that's taking a look at our, at our system around us and saying what, what's going on and how can we figure out how to help? Um, and there's been a lot of them. A question uh, has, did come up in the Q&A that, that you know, where, where are all of these species found? So salmon on the West Coast are endangered just about everywhere. Um, they're up and down the West Coast, but again, also trout species are affected by this chemical. Trout are everywhere. We hear about a species of fish in Japan that's affected by this. This is truly a global crisis. Now, um, uh, just here in Washington State, a uh, State of the Salmon report came out about two weeks ago, and I'll, you know, they thankfully put things in color codes here that do you know, lend to the visualization of the importance of this crisis here, that a lot of things aren't doing well. 
Uh, and there's a lot of reasons that a lot of those things aren't doing well. And, and the governor's uh, office of salmon recovery put together this kind of you know, infographic of the six key ways that, that salmon aren't doing real, real well. Um, polluted water, fish um, uh, passage barriers, things like culverts and dams, roadways that have, have paved over streams. Streams, if you look on you know, Google Maps and you're, and you're pulling up your local salmon stream, take a look at, at, at those streams. And, and if you see a right angle, like a stream going up and then it takes a left or a right, and it's a real sharp curve, that doesn't really happen in nature. So that probably goes to show that there's some fill in uh, there, there might be a road that needed to turn left there first. And, and so we've really just built up this world uh, that, the, that the fish are expected to swim through and survive in. And it's really, really difficult. Climate change is changing all that and loss and degradation of habitat have really threatened fish. This one chemical is central to that polluted water um, problem right there facing our, our fish. Uh, Jen also mentioned the three-year time clock that we have here, and that's gonna be a theme of a lot of what I talk about later is that we've got an urgency to this problem. Uh, we see every year here at Puget Soundkeeper and Longfellow Creek in West Seattle, where over about 15 years, we've had well over a hundred community scientists uh, head on out walk up and down Longfellow Creek doing salmon surveys, looking for pre-spawn mortality, tracking the fish returning to the stream every year. Longfellow Creek in West Seattle starts, it's, a, it's, a, it's about a five foot wide uh, culvert that has a grate in front of it like prison bars. And then fish that make it through that grate, that swim up through that, they have to go under about a half mile of decked over parking lots in the pitch black before they reach an urban stream that only really runs about two miles through heavily developed um, uh, or urban area and ends at a golf course where, by the way, I think 6PPD is also found in golf balls, but we can talk about that later. And, and throughout the whole system, you know, our volunteers find every salmon uh, spawning cycle, uh, tons and tons and tons of, of pre-spawn mortality in the returning uh, female coho. This year, the data that, that we've got early crunching is, is of the coho that did, that did return, there was a 33% pre-spawn mortality. Um, it's, it's real urgent, this crisis. It's everywhere. It's not just in Seattle. Um, and it's compounded by all those other impacts. I do want to return to this very, very toxic issue here because, you know, I want you to, to balance in your brains this, this, this fact that this is emerging and this is new. This uh, somewhat grainier version of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the slide that uh, Dr. McIntyre shared shows that this is also one of the only things that we don't have uh, EPA information on. And, and I pulled up the Eco uh, Comptox chemical dashboard at EPA just to pull up all of the lists that 6PPD is on. Uh, it's known, it's on uh, this reporting system and that reporting system, it's on a Euro reporting system and an international reporting system. And then I pulled up 6PPD Quinone and it's on two lists. And one of those lists is a draft list of Wikipedia chemicals. I'm not sure what that draft list is, but it just goes to show that there's that this is absolutely new and for something this new to be so toxic uh, and affecting the, the fish species that, that it kills, that the mortality that it drives is just shocking to me. And so we, we really need to be taking this seriously. But again, green infrastructure is the, is the, is the short-term solution here. We do not have decades to wait to find an alternative and put it into every tire on the entire planet. Um, tires are everywhere. Tires are on vehicles. They're on every single vehicle. Some of the studies that are that are going on and some of the conversations led in large part by all the, the amazing folks at, at EPA Region 10 and at the State Department of Ecology uh, and all the work groups with all the researchers that are going on in this region, the information that California is developing, um, showing that the tires themselves just, you know, when you've got vehicles that 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 are heavy, they wear down tire particles more. When they sit there in the sun, they can bake down and the more the smaller the particle, the more surface area. So it's just, it's just bad. I don't want to lose sight of the fact that tires are a big part of the problem here, if not the largest part, but they're also uh, in secondary markets. And so they're in roadways that are being made with recycled tires. There's fields and soccer fields and, and playgrounds that are being made um, with recycled tires, retreads, uh, windshield wipers, roofs have recycled tires in them. It's, it's, a, it's a massive problem everywhere. We also have them as artificial reefs. Here's a bunch of photos of tires in the environment pulled from the internet. One of these is from Washington Scuba Alliance. There's, there's 15 to 20 tire reefs in the Puget Sound alone that have about 10,000 tires in them each uh, that are just put together out there and not really particularly serving a purpose. 
but there's tires uh, in wetlands, there's tires that have been used as infill, there's tires that are used as part of green infrastructure uh, establishments, there's tires alongside docks and as bumpers on boats. I hate to see whenever I'm, I'm, I'm now looking at salmon streams where you see a dock alongside, you've got tires being used as bumpers. And so every time um, water sloshes over those tires, it's just direct discharging 6 PBD quinone into these salmon streams. Uh, and so there, it's a really global problem. It's literally everywhere. Um, here's some information from a review that, that California did. I think this is about a year ago now, or a year and a half ago now, where they were looking at just the sheer scope of the problem facing California. 470,000 metric tons of tire waste in 2019 alone in California. Not a lot of places that generate tire waste, probably, you know, giant businesses and shipping companies probably have baked into their into their sustainability plans end of life solutions for tire chemicals things that that you you otherwise would start to do now in, in the climate context you know what are the emissions how is what is our impact gauging those liabilities that that your operations present to the environment around you but because this is so new because this is so unknown uh, places don't really have that baked into their sustainability practices and their and their approach to good governance um, turf fields are also a big issue. We heard about how there's just becoming some emerging information on the uh, on 6 PBD levels in, in, in people. Um, turf fields, uh, one report that was cited in the California Review here said that a European football pitch uh, has 20 to 40,000 tires uh, inside as crumb rubber turned up and put in there. And they lose about another 1,000 um, uh, to 2,000 tires per year to, to build back in some of that crumb rubber as it dissolves and gets drained out of those systems. Now, this otherwise wouldn't you know, be too concerning if those places were treated, but a lot of parks, a lot of bike paths, a lot of playgrounds, a lot of these soccer pitches, a lot of places with chrome rubber have drainage ditches that, that pipe directly to streams and pipe directly to habitat. And so it's really, it's a global problem, not just in the tire world itself. A quick look at, at Stormwater 101 for folks that, that um, may not be aware of how it's managed, but in large part, it's managed you know, with two kind of things. One is the more on the ground, roll up your sleeves, do the work of managing. And one is the system-wide reviews of how you're, you're working on stuff. And on the ground, there's permits, permits, permits. And so there's, there's literally documents out there governing how cities, roads, bridges have to design, build, deploy green infrastructure, stormwater management, best practices, how they do street sweeping, how often, where, when, why. Same thing with commercial and industrial sites. How are you maintaining your parking lots and how are you running your industrial operations and where are you testing? Um, when are you testing? What are you testing for? For new, new pavements sprawl, uh, there's redevelopment and new development guidelines. There's construction general permits that need to be obtained. And in all of these documents, there's, there's language in there about how to best run those sites to most appropriately protect the environment around us. And on top of all those kind of nitty gritty of the paperwork is you know, a suite of system-wide rules like fisheries assessments and endangered species reviews. Coho are endangered throughout most of their range. They probably should be as well uh, throughout the entirety of their range, um, but Chinook and, and Steelhead are endangered as well. Lots of trout are endangered throughout the country. Um, there's also a Clean Water Act limits, not causing or contributing to water quality violations. These are rules that are designed to make sure that these permits do you know, do their job in protecting the, the fish, the habitat, the, the communities, and the people that depend on all of the above. But when, they're, when there's something this new, when there's something this discreet, this, this uh, impactful as 6 PBD quinone, it doesn't necessarily fall neatly into one of those buckets. And so one of the things that we're working on right now is looking at how to move 6 PBD quinone into the world of regulations. Because it's 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 a it's a great idea that we should we should work on this, but it's not until it's effectuated through regulations, through laws, through through requirements placed on the, the places that are generating this pollution, then it just remains something that we're just shocked at the fact that it's happening. Look at climate change. Look at a whole bunch of other emerging contaminants like PFAS. Until it actually moves into the world of something that the federal government considers a hazardous material or something that's on a drinking water list, it's not gonna ever be governed and then so we can start the process of rolling back the problems. Here in the Puget Sound, we've got a couple opportunities coming up right now. If you're in our watershed, I saw folks joining this call from, from all across the country. Every single state has all of these things going on as well. You've got state permits. Here in Washington this fall, we're gonna be seeing state permits 
governing how all of our cities approach stormwater management. Uh, we have industrial permits here and you've got industrial stormwater permits in every state in the country that govern how industrial sites deal with their permits. And here uh, we also have um, permits issued by the federal government. We have one for a, a, a large military facility here in the Puget Sound. And that was just put out for public comment about two weeks ago. And in that write-up, they mentioned 6 PBD quinone. The EPA noted that there's best practices, which is another word for green infrastructure installations in large part, that allow us to come up with plans today, right now, for how we deploy some of these best ideas on green infrastructure to solve the problem of 6 PBD quinone and protect endangered species. Uh, that permit is out for public comment at the moment. There's also a, a ton of lurking liabilities here. I'm a fan of alliteration, so lurking liabilities and the scourge of salmon. Um, you'll see that throughout the slides today. Um, one of those is regulatory gaps. Uh, in the Clean Water Act, you know, uh, not everything has to have a permit. And so some places that, that never had permits before may have escaped uh, coverage by permits and stormwater controls and rules about where to put in green infrastructure, or how to test your stormwater, how to maintain or build a site because they didn't do things that were traditionally understood as being um, pollution generating. So if you didn't do oil changes or have a smelter or a giant pile of recycled metal, or you weren't a landfill, generally speaking in the past, you avoided needing to get a permit. But now given that we know so directly that this toxicant is coming from tires and rubber, uh, there may be new permit coverages on the horizon for places that have never needed to get permits before. And this unpermitted discharge um, problem is, 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 is definitely at the forefront of a lot of lists as we look into places that haven't had to control stormwater before because of our past preconce preconceived notions of what is a pollutant and what should be done to protect salmon. There's also uh, this, this large issue of, of a potential new Montreal protocol. And, and a Montreal protocol, to my rudimentary knowledge, is when we were looking at the hole in the ozone layer 30 or 40 years ago, and coming up with how do we solve it, we, we looked at all the pollutants that were causing it and, and found out generally speaking, and I'm, there's entire books written on this, that those pollutants were generally made by a few places and were used for a few reasons and were causing massive amounts of global damage. Uh, here we have the exact same thing. This is a chemical that's been used for 60 years, but is generally produced by a few places and it's used for one purpose and that's tires. There's different uh, anti-ozonates that are in a whole bunch of different types of rubber, and this is the largest one that's used in tires. And so we've got this ability to make global lasting change and save salmon if we all come together and work on it. Um, I want to go back to this slide real quick in, in uh, an attempt to close up uh, my remarks real quick. And that's, the, and that's to say that, that one of the things here is that, you know, we have these fish that are, it's not just about their acute mortality. It's not just about uh, how many fish die. It can also be about the erosion of the robust resilience of the species overall. And so when you've got a fish species that's being bombarded by the impacts of climate change or is seeing their habitat lost or has to jump over more barriers and go through more culverts than they used to have to go through or should be having to go through, you need a fish that's resilient, that's robust. We talk a lot here about you know, how a lot of the industrial pollution in our fish and our salmon waterways are at the near the mouths of river where historically uh, industry was located for access to, to ocean going shipping and things. And that meant that salmon had to really, really grow in that year and a half that they live upstream to be resilient enough to make it through these gauntlets of industrial pollution and Superfund sites and PCB contamination. Uh, and right now when you've got a, a tire pollutant, the 6 PBD quinone that's affecting fish so acutely and, and, and horribly, um, you're really reducing the, 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 the resilience of the species overall to deal with all of these other stressors. Uh, and so, you know, I want you to imagine a world where you've got these two fish coming back into a creek. Imagine if instead of one of them having died before spawning, they both died after spawning. How many more fish would our streams be pumping out into the oceans to, go, to grow, get those nutrients and come on back and feed our forests, um, feed, feed people? Uh, and really support a thriving ecosystem if those 33% in Longfellow Creek that we counted with just you know a dozen or two volunteers this fall heading out there a couple days per week, if they had all, instead of those 33% dying, if they had all spawned before they had died, we'd have a lot more of a robust population and a much more resilient species. 
Uh, in the state, state of the Salmon report from the governor's office, again, just released two weeks ago, um, the, the, the entirety of the conversation about stormwater pollution was boiled down to exactly what I put here on the screen, uh, noting that we had found 6 pvd quinone, um, the, that researchers had figured it out and they found out that rain gardens uh, reduce harm to coho and other fish species. A lot, of, a lot of the preconceived notions on this chemical is that it's just coho, but it's not. Uh, but it ended with this hopeful statement here that these discoveries coupled with effective stormwater requirements will protect salmon in cities, ensuring that our growing population can coexist with salmon. That's very hopeful, but I find a couple things wrong with it. The discoveries on their own, if they're not coupled with real action taken at, by our agencies, put into place in permits, followed up with, with investments and in technical assistance and good ideas and timeframes that are key to the species needing to come back in three years and spawn again, will not ensure that they coexist, that our cities coexist. Moreover, it's not just the city's problem, it's where there's roads and tires. You could have a giant tire landfill at the top of the most pristine place as far as you want from a city, and it's still gonna be leaching uh, 6 ppd quinone into those salmon streams. This is something that we, we have to take seriously and we have to approach um, across a whole bunch of lines of inquiry. This is a slide taken from the State Department of Ecology here in Washington, looking at all the different aspects of the work that is a, that's ahead of us. But I think that one of the things I want to leave you on, and this is my, my last slide, is that you know we, we've got three years before this year's salmon that are heading out, come on back, um, and, and need to, to get back here, not die before they can spawn again. We've researched, we know how bad it is, we know that green infrastructure helps. Those are two things that are done. We're looking at other species and sublethal effects, things like make, you know, even if they do spawn, does it reduce the, the, the amount of viable eggs that come out? Those are all questions that are being answered right now, but we need to turn to the next two chapters of, of how to approach this problem. We don't have a lot of time. One is control, getting alternatives, talking about that. The sooner we find an alternative, the sooner we can start the decades long process to change out every tire on the planet. Again, every tire on the planet to take this chemical out of them. We need to look at the life cycle of tires. There's currently nothing anywhere right now preventing anyone from building a new playground right next to a salmon stream or where there's you know, a brook trout or rainbow trout facility that is made out of crumb rubber tires. Absolutely nothing controlling whether or not that facility has to put in green infrastructure to treat the discharges coming off of that site. There's nothing preventing that from happening right now. We've got to get control of that secondary market for waste tires. And we have to stop making things worse. Uh, every day, there's departments of transportation and municipal budgets get passed and projects get, get approved that put in new bridges, new roads, new you know, storm drains, new curbs, new sidewalks. We need to start designing every single thing we do for green infrastructure to be better. It's not just about the salmon, like I said before, it's air quality, it's environmental quality, it's energy resilience, it's climate change resilience. It's clean air, asthma rates go down, green infrastructure is good for a whole variety of reasons. We need to stop making things worse. And then we need to resolve this problem totally. We need to figure out how to have resilient systems for salmon so that they can absorb some of the places that are the hardest ones to get to to put in green infrastructure. Those, those giant bridges over salmon streams or the dam that we have right here, uh, here at the Ballard Locks and Salmon, that's just a confluence of roads and narrow places and a lot of storm water goes right out and salmon have to swim through all of it to get upstream, they need to be more resilient. So they need cooler temperatures, more habitat, stronger bodies so that they can absorb more the shock of so many of these pollutants. And we need to start enforcing, enforcing, enforcing this issue at all levels of our clean water advocacy. And lastly, again, just to hit on this point, 150 more times green infrastructure. We have the knowledge, we, we've known for a decade or more that green infrastructure is good for a bunch of reasons, salmon included on this issue, we knew that this was the solution before we discovered the chemical that was the problem. If that tells you anything, it tells you we need to be doing more of that. Um, so that's that's uh, my slideshow for today and, and happy to stay and answer as many questions as we can fit in with time. So thank you very much. Thank you so much um, to both of you. That was a ton of really awesome, super helpful information. I appreciate you all taking the time. Just to bring this home to the Columbia a little bit, you know, you all are on the forefront of this research um, up in the Puget Sound area, but we know that 
this chemical 6PPD has been added to car tires since the 70s. You know, this is potentially a global issue in urban streams anywhere. And we do have coho salmon, you know, that appear to be the most sensitive species. Also, um, you know, rainbow trout, steelhead trout here in the Columbia. So although we don't have the robust data that, you know, is coming out of the Puget Sound area, this is something that is definitely we need to be paying attention to here in the Columbia Basin. We need, you know, some more information on how much this issue is impacting our fish, because I think all the pieces are there that, um, you know, this is potentially a really serious issue here in the Columbia too. So I really appreciate you bringing the expertise here to our basin. I just want to mention, we will be sharing a recording of this with everyone. Um, if Sean and Dr. McIntyre, if you have just a couple minutes, maybe we can hit just a few of the questions. Um, I know we kind of ran out of time, but uh, one of the questions that came up was, and Sean, you touched on this, but maybe uh, Dr. McIntyre, you could speak to some, some folks have been asking about, is 6PPDQ um, considered a persistent chemical in the way say PFAS is? And, you know, kind of along those lines, how quickly does it break down in the environment? Um, and is this an issue when you're thinking about this chemical being filtered through kind of biofiltration systems? Do we need to be thinking about kind of how we deal with that um, waste that are that it's in those filtration? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll address that as, as much as I can, because um, we don't have a lot of information yet on persistence. However, um, it's not going to be persistent the way some of our forever chemicals, you know, um, are including the PFASs, um, you know, PBDs, PCBs, things like that. Um, uh, what we know about the persistence of 6PPD, the parent chemical, also, we, you know, people are measuring out in the environment just because it is so common, um, you know, so, present in such relatively high concentrations in tires. It'll get out in the environment, but it is designed to react, right, with ozone. So it's a very reactive chemical. It decreases really rapidly over time. 6PPD quinone is a little more persistent than that. Um, so when we add it to water, we can put it in water, leave it in the fridge or on the you know, countertop at the lab, and it'll last for months in the water. Um, however, it is an organic chemical, um, and it will be taken up by biota and then transformed and, and released. We don't know much yet about what happens inside our bodies, fish's bodies, in terms of what it gets transformed into and whether any of the you know, any of that chemical that gets taken up gets just directly put back out into the environment. Um, so those are definitely unknowns. Let's see, um, in terms of rain gardens, again, because it's an organic contaminant, it is possible that it's broken down microbially, which is one of the benefits of a, of a living system green infrastructure, um, is that it's colonized naturally or intentionally with microbiota. And we know, for example, like PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons from like fossil fuels, combustion, things like that. Those degrade pretty readily in those systems because of the microbial community. Uh, unlike things like metals that when they're trapped in those bioretention systems, they will just continue to increase in concentration over time till eventually, you know, we might have um, a soil that's polluted enough, it needs to be replaced because of the metals. But those organics luckily can be broken down in situ by microbiota. Thank you. And maybe just a quick question. Um, do we know if 6PPD is added to bicycle tires? Have you seen anything, Sean? I know Nina, Nina Zhao in, in Ed's group just published that paper looking at different types of rubber. Um, and I can't remember if bicycle tires was on there. Yeah, the, 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 some of the research I've found from the 1990s is that it is in, in bicycle tires and it's in retread tires. It's in tires for giant earth movers. It's, in all, it's on all of those. Some of the other 6PBDs and anti-ozonates and stuff like that need to be coupled because they're less effective from my understanding of the chemistry and its applications in, in the industry. They're less effective at certain aspects of being an anti-ozonate. So they need to have, say, like a waxy substance applied on the outside of the tire in order to protect it a little bit more. So there's other things that you'd have to do if you used other less effective things. And so most tires that, that aren't in a position to have additional treatments or things put on them need to use this kind of one cure-all uh, uh, preventative preservative. Thank you. 
And someone asked, for those of us who monitor for stormwater, is there a way that we can test for 6-PPDQ? And if not, are there proxies for 6-PPDQ like copper and or zinc that we could measure? There are um, methods that have been developed to measure 6-PPD quinone. So far, I don't believe there's any certified methods in the state. Like if you want to take it to a, a lab and have it be like Washington State certified, um, I think Washington State Labs has a certified process now. I don't know if, you know, if, if all of the people out there would be able to submit samples to them. Um, I know that SGS Access in um, just across the border in BC, they have a, a method, again, don't know if it's certified by the state of Washington, but that's, and, and those samples are pretty pricey right now, around like $500 probably for a water sample. So I don't know how accessible that is for folks. Yeah, and, and I, but I will add on the proxy, you know, it's, it's real, it, it depends on what you need the data for. And I think that, you know, there was this one presentation by some consultants for the State Department of Ecology here in Washington that said, you listen, the most clear example of problem A from tires leading to prob, you know, problem B, death in salmon, is when you've got a road that has a drain, that has a pipe that discharges into a creek. And that is everywhere. And so it doesn't, you know, you don't need to necessarily look um, beyond that as a proxy um, when you're looking at the, the physical structures of your drainage system, of your streetscape, and of your stormwater area. But if you're if you're trying to use that data for other things, I know that the more that this is tested for, the more that we understand methods of testing, and the more people are going to need this for things like permits and enforcement compliance and hotspot mapping, which is a conversation going on in the chat at the moment. Then the more that price point is going to come down, and we're going to have standardized ways of dealing with this. Um, that's the exact same trajectory that the PFAS compounds went through. There were a couple of years when there was just a haphazard approach to testing for them and that narrowed. And then once it narrowed enough, then it became something that was a much more easy to test for system. And so we're, we're right at the cusp of that. Thank you. And there, there've been a few questions. Sean, you showed a picture of submerged tires uh, used for reefs or um, docking that sometimes is submerged. And so there have been a few questions kind of circling around whether or not submerged tires are exposed to kind of the same amount of ozone, therefore leaching the same amount of 6-PPDQ. Um, you know, I don't know if we know much about, you know, if tires that aren't being as used as much, you know, obviously there's some weathering, but is, do we think that there's the same kind of breakdown in 6-PPDQ leaching and tires that are submerged? Um, I'll, I'll answer from my non-scientific standpoint and then see if Jen has any thoughts on that or what the research is going on on that. But, you know, it's the, the tire wear particles, the smaller things, the ones that have a lot more surface area are going to leach the insides out a lot quicker. And so that's going to generally come from when tires are going over gravelly roads or when they're hitting a curb and bouncing or just being worn because they're at high speeds or are heavier vehicles. Those are going to be generating a lot of those tire wear particles. In large part, those particles, those little tiny tire dusts that are everywhere, tend to sit places until they're either, you know, washed down or blown down a storm drain, and even then they can sit until it rains. And so, if you've got, you know, two months of real high hot heat and no rain, like we some like we've had the last two summers here in Seattle, those tire wear particles aren't going anywhere. The six PPD quinone is just waiting to be released, and then the first time we have a storm event all of that kind of rushes into the storm drains, which is horribly what the fish are waiting for just off stream. They're waiting for those first storm events of the year to get triggered, to come on up and start swimming upstream. And so they wait for those big first flushes of, 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 of water coming out, the fresh water coming out. And so that's gonna remain your largest source, but tires alongside docks and, and, and in those reefs yeah, they most certainly have uh, a 6-PPD quinone that's been turned into the 6-PPDQ and then when they are leached out, it's especially problematic in my, in my rudimentary understanding of this uh, at docks and along boats because you're much more likely to have water wash off that outside layer of 6-PPDQ and have a new layer of 6-PPDQ generated from the new ozone that's always around marinas and fuels and boat ramps and things like that. Uh, and so it's going to be a constant source of pollution. The fully submerged ones, I've had a couple people in, you know, let me know that the early indication is, is that they probably lost or leached out all their 6-PPDQ right when they were first submerged, but because there's no ozone, 
um, you know, 50 or 100 meters down, then that's not going to be too much of a problem for a new 6 bbd cube to come from those. But again, I'll turn back to there's other horrible things in tires <laughs> that you don't want leaching into your systems. You don't want fish, you know, you know, setting up their house inside of a tire for a lot of other reasons other than 6 bbd cube. So that's why those reefs are, are a horrible idea for a bunch of other reasons. I'll just, I'll add a little bit to the whole tires versus particles. So totally agree with Sean on, you know, the high surface area of the particles will mean relatively much higher leaching rates um, of our chemical and all chemicals really. Um, uh, as far as the whole tires, one of the first experiments I did with tires at all was um, to compare uh, tires for use in, in like marine fenders um, on docks and stuff like that compared to a, um, an EPDM based synthetic fender that was that was being generated by a by a businessman. And um, so to, for that study, I took like a little little piece of his stuff, um, his EPDM material, put it in a tank with my fish took the same you know, weight of a piece of tire, put it in my tank with fish and all those fish were dead the next day. So this is like you know, a 10 gallon tank with like a little piece of tire in it, all the fish were dead the next day. So plenty, plenty of opportunity for the chemical to leach into water, even though it's much higher what would be leached off of the particles. Wow, thanks for, thanks for sharing that. And I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. Thank you so much for letting us run over a little bit with some questions and maybe I'll, end with uh so folks have been taught kind of i think in thinking about storm water uh remembering the issue with um copper brake pads and how that was dealt with and um just curious if either of you might be able to kind of speak to lessons that we learned from that you know kind of around our willingness to to change or if there's any takeaways from that, uh, you know, I think a pe people are noticing sort of a similarity around this issue. And so is there anything we can take away from that um, to move forward with this issue? Um, I, I think uh, I'll step into that first, Jen, on the public policy side of that. And, and, and I think the hardest thing is that there's alternatives and solutions and someplace for people to go for so many other problems we have and we deal with. You know, you can get a stainless steel um, mug, you can get a different type of plastic, you can reduce this or you can change that. Um, there's compostable this and compostable that. There really is no other alternative and our life revolves around vehicles for food, for, you know, bringing other vehicles here, you know, things like mining, uh, farming, um, city life, going to school, work, everything. Even if you take public transportation, there's vehicles and there's tires. And so it really is something that demands, you know, high level investment in progress towards an alternative at the exact same time we recognize that that's going to take decades and our fish are endangered. And if this were anything else, when we were running, uh, when a bunch of boats were running into North Atlantic right whales off Boston, we changed a shipping lane into, this, into, the, into the Boston Harbor to avoid running into whales. We said, where are they running into them? Where are they not? Let's go where they're not and we can solve this crisis. It was a massive change that affected international shipping and interests. We need that kind of thing here. We have endangered species uh, from one end of the country all the way to the other end of the country. Uh, we've got fish that are affected by this throughout the entirety of the nation uh, where, where the trout uh, roam. And it's it's something that needs to happen everywhere all at once. We, we, we need green infrastructure uh, and all of these things uh, need help from government, governance. They need permit changes, they need regulatory changes, they need more investments in, um, in technical assistance and best practices, innovations, uh, and that's stuff that consumers can't necessarily do on their own. And that's the hardest part of all of this, is this, this species really needs something done for it that people can't do one at a time, but what people can do is they can call the people in charge, they can invest in science, they can support researchers, they can ask where this tire is going when you drop it off at a facility. Um, there's a lot of things you can do right now. And I think all of our websites, the Washington Stormwater Center and Columbia Riverkeeper and Puget Soundkeeper, we've all got ways that people can help uh, on the public policy side of this issue, um, trying to fight for these endangered species. Thanks so much, everyone. And, you know, I want to thank everyone for attending today. And, you know, I 
I'm sure you can all tell that, you know, this work, the science is growing around this. And I definitely want to encourage people to continue learning about this issue. Um, I think we're going to be hearing more and more about it. So please consider joining Puget Soundkeeper, supporting their important work. And I also want to encourage you to become a member of Columbia Riverkeeper. Um, so with that, I just want to say thank you for your participation. And um, thanks so much to our speakers.